Hi, I'm Peter Birch, and in this show, we've gone all the way to far north Queensland to take a look at Michael Cermak's amazing collection of Australian green tree pythons. Come with me and check them out. You're watching Critican. I love the way Michael has made these enclosures and the environment as close to nature as possible with all these magnificent plants and the way the cages are set out with lots of perches enabling the animals to move vertically. Impressively, he's also placed plastic sheets on top of the enclosures for when they have large periods of rain, like today, to protect the animals to give them the opportunity to move in and out of those environments. That is truly spectacular. Let's talk to Michael and see what else he's going to tell us. This week's question of the week. What is the largest threat to the wild population of green tree pythons in Australia? Is it poaching, global warming or deforestation? Please leave a comment below. Yeah, when I embarked on this project eight years ago, and actually in 2005, I've done a fair bit of research. We're looking at the climatic conditions here in Cairns and at the Cape York and Ryan Range. And surprisingly, it's very, very similar. So that sort of gave me the idea that I could set up the outdoor cages and uh, keep my snakes sort of in the, as much natural conditions as possible. Because more than anything else, I'm interested in their behavior. And uh, that allows me to make some interesting observations. So, uh, yeah, I go out at night with the torch every now and then and see what's happening, what they're doing. And uh, unlike uh, a lot of people think that green pythons are sort of lazy slugs, they sit there all day, they're boring, they do nothing. Well, you've got to give them some incentive to move around and they do respond. You okay. know, um, environmental enrichment or behavioural enrichment, whatever you want to call it. Um, something like this. Yep. And I change it every fortnight or every month, you know, I go through it and put in different branches, different things. Sometimes I just pick up a plant from them, throw it into the cage, and I can guarantee you the snakes will be all over it at night. Okay. And, uh, you know, that, that's my way of looking at things. Active snakes are healthy snakes. Uh, the other thing is I'm uh, wondering, you know, we, so, we sort of this, this established pattern that we feed our snakes regularly, once yep. a week or whatever, five days. When you think about it, it takes probably four, five, six days for the snake to digest the food, mm -hmm. depending on the size, of course, and conditions. But what it's telling me, you know, if you feed your snakes every Friday, the snake is constantly in a mode of digesting. Mm -hmm. And they don't move much, do they, when no. they have a gut full? So I'm... Um, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so I'm sort of changing it a little bit now, and I feed them irregularly. You know, okay. I give them, sometimes I give them more than I normally would, mm -hmm. and then I'll just let them go for two or three weeks. And mm -hmm. I give them a little bit, and kind of, you know, I don't know if it's going to make any difference at the end of the day, but I, uh, I believe that's probably much more like what, what's happening in a while. More naturalistic, They don't definitely. get a mouse every Friday. Oh, no. no. <laughs> it's such luxury they don't get. We definitely yeah. don't know. Yeah, when it comes to drinking, you know, again, there's this um, perception that you have to spray them because they, they're poor drinkers. They have to lick the yep. droplets of their body. Well, they do it because it's like, you know, surf to them on a silver platter. Yep. Why should they move down to the water bowl? Mm -hmm. But they, they drink normally like any other snake. You know, the longest the water dish is uh, sort of not too low, behind, you know, below the lowest yep. branch, they can just go down and drink like any other snake. I, I guess uh, I don't spray my snakes at all. Okay. Not even the hedgehogs. There's a few, uh, I, I guess, um, misconceptions about chondros, and I, I guess you know you breeding so many would be the person to talk to and sort of break down the barriers of those misconceptions. Yeah, there are, there are a number. Yeah, and one of the things that I'm currently interested in, um, well, actually, I should go back in 2008, I uh, selected 27 juveniles and I kept them for one year just to see how the ontogenic color change actually works, you know, what's the timing and the duration. And it yep. was quite interesting because they, they're very different to the equatorial green pythons, our natives. They, uh, they usually change colour, I think the average from memory was nine and a half months, okay. give and take. And uh, the duration was average of four or five days. So it happens very rapidly. Yep. Whereas some of the equatorial things, you know, they, they start changing colour at the end of three months and sometimes it goes on for two or even three years. Yeah. So I still don't know what triggers the 
ontogenic color change, which is of great interest to me. But you know, it's just I'm sort of looking at it like, what is the difference between Cape York and New Guinea? And it's the seasonality. Mm -hmm. You know, we have very pronounced wet and dry seasons, which they don't have there. Okay. But I still can't pinpoint. You know, what what actually what would makes it happen? It yeah, 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 exactly. The other thing is the the vertebral line in our native yep. greens, which is white or sometimes yellowish. Uh, it's been well documented that captive bred native green tree pythons have reduced white striping. Okay. And uh, nobody knows why. The American people, they found the same thing with the Maruti ones, which look very similar. Yep. So this year I'm set up to run a proper experiment where I'm going to set up a treatment and a control. Yep. And uh, I'm going to expose them to UV, natural UV, not the artificial mm -hmm. one. Uh, that, that's been one of the theories that you know, because of lack of exposure to UV that white line does not develop properly. I'm skeptical about it to be mm -hmm. honest, but I feel that it needs to be done and set the record once for all. Uh, they just, uh, well this is the nursery, that's okay. where things happen. The gravid females, they come in here when it's getting a little bit cold outside in the winter. And they basically, uh, they settled here, this is a uh, lie box that I'm using. Okay. Uh, I used to put in spikenum moss, but I don't bother anymore because, you know, the female goes in probably three, four days before laying. Yep. And by the time she lies, the spikenum moss is completely dry, so what's the point? Okay. Uh, the eggs don't stick to the polystyrene any more than they do to each other. Yep. So as long as you can separate the cluster, you know, this is quite, quite okay. all right. Yeah. So you can get them out pretty easy. Yeah, and uh, as soon as they lay eggs, the female goes outside, I'll give them a good shower to wash off all the eggy smell and mm -hmm. uh, life goes on. Okay, awesome. And uh, here we have uh, one of the yellow hatchlings, still yellow, in the ambush position. That's mm -hmm. how they hunt. And, uh, you know, the bigger they are, the more vertical space they need for that very reason. You okay. know, if this was half the height, they wouldn't be able to assume that position. I guess the other thing that most people uh, probably attribute or probably think poorly for chondros is the tail. The tail is so fragile. But I've noticed that you have taken these animals out quite easily without, you know, putting on your delicate mittens basically and playing with them. Well, and and, and they've, they, they, you know, there's nothing wrong with these animals. No, I would be a little bit more careful with something smaller, yep. but you know, as long as you peel them off the perch, and they usually let go. I definitely time. noticed you had that technique where it was like, basically, yeah, yeah, like yeah. you said, You've it's like peeling it, from it open. Sides yeah. and just it's coming from underneath, yeah. it's not just grabbing it and pulling it off. No, 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 you don't yep. do that. Or better yet, you know, just give them a bit of a tickle and they come onto your hand. Or, yeah. Nice. Did you want to show us that other little fella there that you got there? Yeah, this is the uh, mite face. That's my... Uh, Another line of interest on breeding these. Oops. Now he's already changing colour. It's interesting how the, the, the colours just start to explode all over the body around. Yeah, and they start much earlier than the natives. It started changing colour at the age of uh, three and a half months. But it lingers on, you know, it can go up to a year and a half and they're still not quite finished. <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely see why they're the jewels of the forest. And oh, all. absolutely. Yeah, anyone who has reptiles in Australia yeah. loves a chondro. This week's question of the week. What is the largest threat to the wild population of green tree pythons in Australia? If you pick C, deforestation, you're correct. Good job. I've had an absolute blast checking out Michael's green tree pythons. What an amazing collection. I hope you got green with envy. Please leave a comment below, hit me up on Facebook and Twitter. You've been watching Critter Cam.